All right, guys, most of my loyal viewers already know that I love Magellan TV. If you've been watching since like the 2020 days, you really get it. I talk about them all the time. I'm absolutely obsessed. But Magellan TV is a documentary streaming service that has all different types of documentaries, different genres. They've got history. They've got true crime, space. I mean, you name it. For me, I'm always poking around in the true crime area because that's my thing. That's what I'm into. Now, this week, I watched Killer in the Family, and it's a documentary that discusses the idea of if these killings really derive from mental illnesses and if that excuses these horrific acts of violence or if graphic media reporting leads to copycat killings. And it's an extremely fascinating documentary. I highly recommend it. So get this, Magellan TV adds 15 to 20 hours of new content every single week. So true crime fans will never run out of something to watch. New documentaries and docuseries like this one are added weekly. And Magellan TV is the best value of any premium documentary streaming service in both price and quality. Because 4K is always included in your subscription. And get this, there are no ads ever. Now Magellan is so amazing and such a great partner of the channel that they are giving you all a free month-long trial. All you have to do is go to that link in my description and you are hooked up. It is that easy. So go watch. Thank me later. Let me know what's in your queue to watch. I feel like I've already watched so much but there's so much more so tell me what you recommend so I can add that to my queue. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Dark Chapters with Annie Elise. This is a brand new series that we're doing over here on the Ten to Life channel, and it's really where we just dive into a little bit more of the darker and deeper true crime cases out there. So I want to just kind of jump into what we're going to be talking about today and what the case entails. Now, as true crime watchers and listeners, I think that it's safe to say that we are all intrigued with true crime stories to some degree. For some people, it's the psychology behind a killer's mind that really draws them in. For others, it's the sheer insanity of some of the cases, which makes them really want to dive deeper and deeper into the story to learn about it. But what happens when that fascination and that intrigue is taken to the next level? When is the intrigue taken way too far? And what happens when simply hearing and learning about these stories isn't enough? And today's case is about a situation where a true crime obsession went a little too far. All right, guys, let's get right into it. Situated in the northeast part of Oklahoma, Broken Arrow is the largest suburb of Tulsa. It has a population of over 116,000 people. But despite how big it is, it's a very family-oriented town, and it has many parks and a school system that is actually one of the best in the entire state of Oklahoma. So it's really no wonder why people want to live there when they're raising their family, raising their kids. Now, overall, it's considered a place where people feel very comfortable and very safe raising a family. It has churches on almost every single corner and neighbors looking out for one another. The typical, beautiful, cul-de-sac, family living type lifestyle. Well, in 2015, the Bever family was one of those families living in Broken Arrow. The family was a large one, and they lived in a very big and beautiful home. The family consisted of parents David and April, and then they had seven children with quite the age span. At 18 years old, Robert was the oldest. Then they had 16-year-old Michael and 13-year-old Crystal, followed by 12-year-old Daniel, 7-year-old Christopher, 5-year-old Victoria, and little baby Autumn. David was a computer analyst and a programmer, and he worked outside of the home pretty much, but since they had so much space inside the house, he also had a home office inside, where he too spent a large portion of his time. April took on the role of a stay-at-home mother, and while she stayed home with the kids, she still did work a few odd jobs here and there inside of the home to just make a little bit of additional money. So with April at home full-time, the couple decided that it would be best if April also began homeschooling the kids regularly. Now, being a very religious family and wanting to protect their kids from the outside influences of the world, to April and David, this really seemed like a great idea and the best option to control those outside influences. They were also a very close family that stuck to themselves and did everything together. So the idea of homeschooling and not being around a bunch of people wasn't really anything far from the norm for them anyways. It wasn't as though the children were now going to be isolated and pulled away from their friends. They already pretty much did stick to just being with their own family. While homeschooling, especially in today's scary world, can be a very good thing, sometimes we do see cases where kids begin to outgrow it a little bit, and then they start to push back against the idea of being 
so secluded, and they seek out other ways to interact. Well, this was no different for their oldest son, Robert. At first glance, Robert seemed to be like any other teenager. He loved playing video games, and he even started his own YouTube channel under the name Cult Empire Official. On this channel, he began vlogging and talking about games that he enjoyed playing, such as Minecraft. Salute. Hey, everyone. It's me, Cult Empire. In case you didn't know, you found me by accident, or you're expecting someone else. Yeah, why would you do that? Anyway, this is the second first ever update, which I think is a major improvement. I tried a news report theme last time, that's not very vloggy, is it? So I'm being a little more chillinated, writing stuff, scripting. I'm going to make my first skit soon. Can't show you a sneak preview or it would ruin it. It'll be like a minute long. It's, it's, it's going to be some good stuff. I think it's going to be hilarious. It's going to have a few props in it, which is the only delay. So, props for props. Non-profit organization. Their second youngest son, Michael, was just about two years younger than Robert, and they shared a room. So because of this, they shared a lot of similar interests and also spent a lot of their time together. And they would often stay up way into the late hours of the night, talking to each other about their futures, what they wanted to do with their lives, everything in between. They may have been brothers, but they were also definitely best friends as well. Something common in kids who are homeschooled, or in more religious families, I should say, is that screen time is very limited or heavily monitored. But that wasn't the case in the Bever household. And even though April and David went to great lengths to protect these kids from awful things, awful influences in the outside world, all of the kids had complete and total access to the internet. They all played on their iPads regularly, their tablets, every device in between. And since Robert had total access and control to post on YouTube, I would say that it was pretty likely that he was watching a lot of videos on YouTube as well. But eventually, the kids having unrestricted access to the internet started to become a bit of a problem. We all know that sometimes the internet can be used for good, and it can have positive effects. But we also know that in some cases, the internet can have the complete opposite effect, and it can have an extremely negative impact on people, especially children and teenagers, because their brains are still developing, and at that age, they are able to be very easily influenced. For Robert and Michael, the internet became a very negative thing for them, and they realized that something they were really interested in was true crime, specifically school shootings and serial killers. They became obsessed with stories of school shootings, and more importantly, the actual shooters themselves. They found the notoriety that these killers had from such brutal slayings to be absolutely incredible. And over time, they slowly began to get more obsessed with people like Charles Manson, Ted Bundy, some of the most dangerous criminals and killers out there. And the killers that intrigued them all had one major thing in common they had become famous and a household name for the things that they had done. It wasn't just that they were looking into these killings and had some sort of base level knowledge on them. They were basically professionals at that point, and they knew every possible thing that happened in each and every case. They studied each killer to a T and even began taking notes and creating these drawings depicting their admiration for these people. They yearned for that same level of fame, and even said that they wanted their own Wikipedia page the same way like the Columbine shooter and the Aurora movie theater shooters had. They wanted people to know their names. They wanted the fame. They wanted the attention. Now, this obsession did not end there. Their favorite movie became Rampage, which came out in 2010 and was a story of a man living in a small town that just one day snapped and began going on a brutal killing spree, stabbing multiple people and using machine guns. And this movie sort of began to become Robert and Michael's goal in life, if you will, to eliminate people who were deemed useless in society by them. Eventually, since Robert was legally an adult, April and David felt like it was time that he began working and getting accustomed to the ways of society. So Robert began working at a religious call center called Micatech. People would call in for help in prayer, so his job all day was to pray with the customers who were calling in. Now, having this job didn't help Robert to become a better or more religious person, but it did give him actual income for the very first time in his life 
allowing him to go out into the world and buy things that he could never buy before. And with his first check, he immediately went out and bought full body armor, a vest, body shields for his arms and legs, a helmet with a face mask on it, and multiple sets of brand new knives. This was the first time that Robert had actually been able to really act on his obsessions, and he saw that these obsessions and dreams could now very easily become a reality since he had an income to support them. He started staying up into the late hours of the night writing notes about certain materials that he still needed to buy, like specific guns and knives, and he also started writing down his goals, and his main one was that he wanted to kill at least 500 people. Robert started putting thoughts into Michael's ear about the idea of actually killing, actually bringing this fantasy life to fruition. He had shown Michael the things that he had bought, and just like Robert, Michael saw for the first time that the ideas and the obsessions could actually become a reality for them, and he liked it. There weren't really any warning signs for most people to see, though. The family, again, really kept to themselves, and they didn't make themselves known. So for neighbors and other outsiders, it would have been really difficult to tell a major change in either one of the boys. Robert also had a very good and respectable job, and neither of the boys had ever gotten into any sort of trouble around town that would lead anybody to even look in their direction. The only person who actually began noticing more of this odd behavior was their little sister, Crystal. Crystal was 13 years old, so she was closer to her brothers than her other siblings who were much younger than she was, and she began to notice that her older brothers had been collecting knives, and it made her very anxious and also very scared. So she even told her parents one day, but they just brushed it off as boys being boys, as if it was no different than boys being interested in hunting or collecting other things. Now, of course, collecting knives isn't necessarily a bad thing. So initially, I could see why they just tried to brush it off, didn't think that there was any danger to it or that they were harboring these dangerous thoughts. Besides, their sons were always so happy and always had smiles on their faces. So there was no way that they could even dream of them doing bad things or harming people, no less even having those thoughts cross their minds. It didn't take long before Robert and Michael began to form far more serious plans. Their ultimate goal was to live on the road and to become serial killers. They prepared themselves, they made plans, they packed everything up, and on July 22nd, 2015, they began their journeys on becoming the most notorious serial killers in America. Only they had decided that they were going to start with the easiest victims first. At 11.30 p.m., 911 dispatchers received a phone call begging for help. The voice was low and quiet, repeatedly asking for help and telling the dispatchers that their brother had attacked them. The person on the phone managed to give the address to the home, which was none other than the Bever family home. Okay, 911. Broken Air 911. Hello? Hello? Hi, where are you at? Broken Air, Oklahoma, 7411. What address? 709 Magnolia Court. Seven, okay. Are you the only one there? No. My brother's attacking my family. Your dad is attacking your family? No, my brother. Um, he has a knife. Oh, okay, who's attacking your family? What? Who's attacking your family? Yes. Who, who is it? Do they have a call? Are you there? Hello? Hi, what's going on there? What's going on there? Hello? Hello? Two officers first headed to the house unsure of exactly what they were going to see, but upon arrival, they knew that it was going to be something way worse than they had expected. There was blood all over the front sidewalk and even the entryway of the door. When they got closer to the door, they could hear a female yelling, save me, save me, so they forced entry into the door, 
And that was when they witnessed the beginning of the most horrific crime in their entire careers. As soon as they entered the home, Crystal, 13-year-old Crystal, was lying on the floor right by the door with multiple stab wounds all over her body, and her blood was everywhere. They managed to quickly pull her out to where paramedics were waiting outside before going back inside with the realization that more than likely, she was not the only victim. So backup was very quickly called, and almost every detective in the town was at the Bever house in a matter of minutes. They began doing a walkthrough, room by room, unsure of what they would find and if the attacker or attackers were still in the home or not. Not long after searching, they found the bodies of April and 12-year-old Daniel, who they realized was the one who had made that 911 call. There was so much blood all over the room, and they immediately noticed that it had even been purposefully smeared all over the walls and furniture. Whoever did this wanted the scene to look brutal. Both victims had been stabbed so many times that it was hard to tell how many stab wounds they even endured. The paramedics on the scene officially declared both of them deceased. The first half of the house had been cleared now at this point, so they continued the search. As soon as they turned the corner, they saw David. He was crumpled up on the ground, very clearly deceased as well. He too had been stabbed multiple times, and again, there was blood absolutely everywhere. And it was not just pools of blood around the bodies from the stab wounds, but a clear display of the attackers taking their time to make sure that blood was smeared everywhere as a sign of cruelty and that they had been there and that they had done these things with no remorse. They found that the hallway bathroom door had been shut and locked. Nobody responded when they answered the door and they figured, okay, maybe the attackers have to be behind this door. And when the officers kicked the door in, they saw something they never thought that they would see. Instead of the attackers, it was Christopher and Victoria, who were just seven and five years old. Both of them had been stabbed multiple times and were sadly no longer alive as well. Upstairs, officers found the youngest child, Autumn, who was thankfully alive and untouched. The officers described the scene of finding her to be absolutely surreal. She was in her pajamas, sleeping soundly, completely quiet, unaware that her parents and her family had just been brutally slaughtered downstairs. She was getting ready to turn two years old soon, and there was still a birthday cake in the refrigerator downstairs for a birthday celebration with her entire family, a celebration that would never happen. At this point, they still hadn't found the attackers in the home, and they noticed that the back door was slightly open, as if someone was either waiting outside or had possibly run off. So with that, they immediately contacted the canine unit who picked up a scent in the wooded area behind the home. There was a trail in the woods and the officers noticed that pieces of body armor had been discarded along this trail. So they knew that they must have surely been on the right track here. Even though each of the victims had stab wounds, they still had no idea what they were working with or who they were working against. They had no clue if the murderers had guns or what other kinds of weapons they could have on them, and they began to fear a possible ambush in the woods that they were unfamiliar with. But then within five to 10 minutes, the canines located the attackers. In the bushes, they found Robert and Michael, who still had on body armor with black t-shirts on top of the armor. Robert listened to commands and immediately put his hands in the air, but Michael still seemed to be moving his hands and reaching around, not completely cooperating with police. So with no other options and the uncertainty of if they had any weapons or had placed any bombs or trip wires in the area, the dog handler let go of the canine, who quickly grabbed onto Michael's shoulder and only then did he begin to comply. The long walk back to the house gave police plenty of time to assess Robert and Michael while they were both handcuffed. Both the boys showed no signs of remorse, no signs of sadness, and neither one of them acted scared or nervous. It was almost as if they had already accepted that this could be a possible outcome of what they had planned, and they were completely okay with it. One of the boys even said to the officers, it wasn't like how it is on TV, we thought just one cut and they would die. Now, I cannot imagine being one of these officers just witnessing the most horrible crime scene that they had ever seen in their lives, and then hearing the killers speaking about it in just such a cavalier and casual way, as if they were just discussing what happened during a Sunday football game and not a brutal slaughtering, no less a slaughtering of their own family. Police began documenting the scene as well as taking pictures of both of the boys. 
Now, Robert had the most wicked and evil smile on his face in every single photograph. It was clear that he was full of pride over what he had done. Both boys' clothes had been ripped and were covered in dirt and blood as they were both getting put into the back of the police vehicles. And then Robert turned to his brother with the widest smile and said, It's been a pleasure. I'm proud of what I've done. Now, the crime scene itself was absolutely horrific. And upon further investigation, it was found that David had been stabbed at least 28 times with wounds to his torso, face, neck, left arm, and even his hands. Their mother, April, had been killed by blunt force trauma and had more than 48 stab wounds, all to the neck, head, arms, torso, and also her hands. Daniel had been stabbed at least 21 times, stabbed in the back, the shoulder, and the chest. Their other brother, Christopher, had at least 21 stab wounds to the back, chest, shoulder, and lower leg. And lastly, their sister, Victoria, had 23 stab wounds to both sides of her neck, her chest, her back, and her upper arm. Meanwhile, Crystal had been taken to a nearby hospital because her throat had been slit and she had multiple stab wounds to her stomach and arms. She was immediately rushed into surgery, and she managed to survive, although she was now in critical condition. The fact that she was even still alive when officers arrived at the home was a complete miracle. How had these two boys taken out their entire family? Robert and Michael were taken in for questioning where they laid out the gory details of what exactly had gone down that night. Michael told detectives that the planning had started happening about two months prior, back when Robert discovered that he could buy guns in the state of Oklahoma without a permit. He said that his older brother began buying guns and over 1,000 rounds of ammunition. The ammunition was actually set to be delivered the following day, but this was going to be a problem because they knew that David and April would obviously ask questions when that much ammunition was delivered to the house. So with that, they knew they needed to speed things up and that they also needed to kill their family first. And um, did you, now you said he bought body armor, but you kind of said like a bunch of stuff that he bought. What else did he buy besides body armor? Um, besides body armor, knives, and he was in the middle of buying guns and ammunition. I see. Okay. Where did, where did he buy the knives from? eBay did. Okay. EBay. Can you tell me like how many knives or what they looked like or anything like that? I think he had about three normal knives and then one small can of packs. Okay. And then, um, the guns. Where did he start buying guns from? Um, he bought them online. I think the website's like Bud's Gun Shop and it's all right. And he bought two blocks, two block 41. And, um, and a shotgun. I forget, it's like a mock spook, I think. Oh, okay. But the block stuff was what's like called Bud's Gun Shop, I think. Okay. And he bought the mock spook off of the official website and then had them shipped to, um, like, you have now gun, you have now gun clubs, so they were actually a guy now waiting for him. So they were going, they were shipped to... To a gun shop. Here in Broken Arrow? Yep. Okay. And well, the, where is that gun shop, do you know? Um, he said seven miles away, he was planning on biking up. Okay. It's like, um, and I think it's nice to get mall. It's like a now gun shop. Okay. Or something. And, um, then he bought, I think it was like 250 shotgun rounds okay. on eBay. Not even, but on, some on some website. And then I think he bought close to a thousand rounds for the box. Wow. Okay. And uh, but he's he still. Oh, so he was supposed to have to take those up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was supposed to pick them up today. Um, and where was he supposed to pick those? By the ammunition. It was being shipped to the house. The guns were the open now gun shop. Okay. So tell me what what plans you started making and coming up with. Well, originally, I think kind of stayed steady uh, throughout the month. Is so we want to kill everyone at the house first, okay. and then wait for all the packages to show up over the weekend. Um, and then we take the economy to have our state with the guns and uh, start. Okay. Start killing rampaging. Did you know where you were going to drive to? Uh, towards Washington. Washington State or DC? Washington State. Okay. Washington State. Why would you go to Washington State? Just kind of the, no yeah, it's just kind of the direction we planned on. And you said Yukon, did your parents have like a Yukon, is that what it is? Yeah, okay. it's a large Yukon XL. Michael claimed that he didn't want to do it that night, but that Robert told him that there was no other option anymore. So he listened to him, 
But during Michael's entire interrogation, he continuously said that he never stabbed or killed anyone. He always placed the blame onto Robert. Now, this worried the detectives because it was pretty obvious that he wasn't being fully truthful about what had happened, but they needed something more to work with here. So they even tried to almost trick him into admitting something by saying that surely he doesn't want Robert to get all the credit, all the notoriety, and that people will of course be wanting to interview Robert instead of him, but he wouldn't budge. So with the ideas and options to get a confession from Michael running slim, they decided that they would bring in Robert. It was clear to them by the things that he had already said and the way that he was acting that he would be more than willing to tell his story. See, he wanted fame, he wanted notoriety, so they were gonna give it to him and they were gonna get him to tell them everything. But the recordings of Robert were never made available to the public. So detectives came back to Michael and told him that his brother had said that he was more involved than what he was leading them to believe. Even after detectives told Michael that Robert had told them that he was involved in the stabbings, he still wouldn't budge. He told them that Robert said if he didn't help him, that he would kill him too. He stuck with the story that he never wanted to kill them or be a part of it at all, and he stuck to that story for a little while. But then I think he began to get scared when the investigators began telling him that he only had one shot to be honest with them, and that they already knew he was lying anyway. So he then began to change his story, saying that he tried to stab his mom, which then quickly turned into, yeah, I think I did stab my mom. Through Michael's interrogation, a lot of things came to light regarding the boys, also their thought processes and how the murders truly went down. They were smart enough to know that even if they got the chance to use guns to kill their family, it wouldn't be practical because it would be too loud and it would only draw attention to the other family members in the house and also draw attention to the neighbors. So that's when they decided that knives and the crossbow that they had would be the best way to go about it. Now apparently they knew that they wanted to murder their father first, so they planned on using the crossbow to shoot him in the face and then their plan was to work their way through each other family member but the bow apparently hadn't been working, so they had to stick to the knives for everybody. They apparently felt like it would be like in the movies, where they stealthily kill each victim with one blow in silence before anyone else could even be alerted. They then planned that once everyone was dead in the family, they would stick around the house for a day or so, waiting on the ammunition to arrive in the mail. And as they were waiting for the ammunition to arrive, their plan was actually to arrange all of the bodies of their family members in one room, all of them together, to really set the stage for whoever found them. Just absolutely sick. Now, even though they planned to murder David first, their plan did not run smoothly from the start. At around 11.30 p.m., Crystal had knocked on their door to come in. She had entered their room after being invited in and told them that they needed to go downstairs because their mom wanted their help doing the dishes. And Robert apparently took this as a sign that this was the perfect time to begin. So he grabbed Crystal, covered her mouth, and then slit her throat. Once again, he imagined that it would be like in the movies where the victim would instantly fall to the ground just silently and then fade away and die. But Crystal was a fighter. So she began screaming and fighting, which alerted April, her mother, to come running in to check on the commotion. When April entered the room, Robert began stabbing her immediately, which allowed Crystal to run out of the room and get away. Then as Crystal was running out of the room, she was screaming, trying to warn the rest of her family. She managed to grab a cell phone and then run outside, but it triggered the house alarm, which caused Robert and Michael to know where she was, so they went running after her. Michael quickly turned off the house alarm so that neighbors wouldn't begin to hear anything, and before Crystal could call 911, she began to pass out. When she woke up, Robert was carrying her back into the house, which is where she was found when first responders arrived. Absolutely haunting, thinking that she tried to get away, she thought she got away, and then her next memory is being carried back into the house by her brother, her attempted murderer. So once they had gotten back inside, Michael began yelling to warn Robert that their father had heard the commotion and that he was coming toward them. He was afraid that if the two of them got into a fight, his dad would overpower him. So he began stabbing him in the chest and even said that he heard his father take his last breath. After they had murdered David, they began searching for little Christopher and Victoria. The two younger siblings had managed to hide themselves in the bathroom and lock the door. But this next part is extremely hard and it literally breaks me at my core because they were safe and they were okay. 
But Michael began fake crying and telling them to hurry and let him inside because Robert was trying to kill him too. So of course, as any young sibling would do, they opened the door to let him into safety. But he was lying and he had tricked them. And as soon as Christopher opened the door, Michael kicked the door in, allowing both of the boys to get inside before stabbing them both to death. They were cornered in a little bathroom and they had no chance of anywhere else to run and hide. Michael described how he had stabbed Christopher himself and how he had reacted with a very little emotion. Okay, that you didn't want to do it? I don't want to do it. I didn't, um, just be I didn't kill anyone. Okay. I stabbed someone. Who did you stab? Um, my younger brother, Christopher. Christopher? How old is Christopher? Um, nine, I think. What did you stab him with? Um, my knife. What's your knife look like? It's green. On kind of like camouflage on the same like on where your hand goes or where the blade is. It's camouflage. Yeah, it's all camouflage. Oh, the whole thing. Yeah. How big is it? Show me how big it is. I think it's about this big. Okay. Like, so what was what was Christopher doing when you stabbed him? He was laying on the bathroom floor. Robert was also stabbing, and Robert asked him to go over and help him. So I stabbed Christopher, and then where did you stab him? Oh, side of the neck. Really? Okay. You okay? Yeah. You okay? Let me know if you need a break or anything, okay? I'm good. Um, so, was Christopher still alive when you stabbed him? Yes. What was he saying and doing? He was just screaming. Screaming. Was, did you say he was in the bathroom? Yeah, I was next to the toilet and um, with that bathroom. It is so heartbreaking and horrific to imagine what these poor little children went through in their final moments, being betrayed by their own brothers. They probably looked up to their older brothers, who ended up being the ones to hurt them the most. During this, Daniel was able to lock himself in his father's office with a cell phone, and that's when he managed to call the police. And this was who we heard on that 911 call, begging for help. You can even hear the commotion of Michael and Robert trying to get into the office in the background of this call. But Michael knew that his younger brother would likely fall for the same trick that the youngest two had. So he again began acting like he was trying to get to safety, trying to get away from Robert. So when Daniel cracked the door open to allow Michael access, Michael yelled, all yours, over to Robert, who knocked the door in and began attacking and stabbing Daniel to death. And Daniel's last words to his brother was, don't kill me, I love you. Now, if you'll remember, the baby, whose name was Autumn, lived without so much as a scratch on her head. So you might think that even though they are the worst of the worst scum, that they still would never stoop low enough to harm an innocent baby. But that unfortunately couldn't be further from the truth because they had an entire evil plan set up for baby Autumn as well. But starting with Crystal, when they weren't ready, it had thrown them off entirely. By the time they had killed the last person and realized the police were on the way, they completely forgot about Autumn since she hadn't made a peep during the entire massacre. Being such a heavy sleeper may have actually saved her life that day. Investigators were told that the plan was to completely cut off baby Autumn's head because they knew that as serial killers, that was really going to give their story a huge wow factor, the it factor, because to them, not many serial killers are even twisted enough to hurt innocent babies, but they would be, so they would get that level of notoriety. When detectives asked Michael if he would write a statement detailing what they had just talked about, he complied. And additionally, he wrote about the plans that they had after they carried out their murders. They had planned to kill five or more people, going from each location, from gas stations to cafes to restaurants to stores, etc. They had even planned to record all of the killings that they were doing, and then later release the video, once they had gone on this nationwide murder spree. It was their perfect plan to get famous, a quick get famous quick plan, especially since Robert was familiar with YouTube. When detectives searched the house after the murders, they did find two cameras that were set to record the murders. An affidavit confirmed that the thumb drive did have some form of live footage on it, but it didn't specify what it was or how much of the murders were caught, if any. Robert's plan was to record the gory aftermath of each of the bodies after the killings, and the other was to show the crime scene without the bodies. But something that the detectives were struggling to understand was why. Other than the fame of it all, why kill your family? Why not just run away and begin the killing spree? 
What had happened in their lives where they went from a close family to then not caring about what happened to their siblings and their parents? Michael had said mainly that they were in the way and that they made their plans more difficult. Robert, however, didn't really seem to have a reason other than he had an obsession with murder and an obsession with serial killers and that he wanted to kill. He had allegedly been planning to kill his family from as early as 13 years old. So the why of it all would be something that would later be brought up in court, which we're going to get more into in just a little bit. On February 23rd, 2016, seven months after the murders, preliminary hearings began. This was to determine the final charges for Robert and Michael's crimes. Both Michael and Robert were officially charged with five counts of first-degree murder, with an additional count of assault and battery with the intent to kill for what they had done to their younger sister, Crystal. Michael was charged as an adult even though he was 16 years old at the time of the murders. And because Michael was 18 years old, he was also charged as an adult for his murders, and he was eligible for the death penalty. Now, while awaiting trial in June of 2016, Robert was found in his cell attempting to take his own life. The staff had been performing a routine check when they found Robert to be attempting to take his own life with a bedsheet. They immediately cut the sheet down and evaluated him. After he was found to have no serious injuries, he was then placed on special watch. A couple of months later, the decision to pursue or not pursue the death penalty for Robert was decided with Crystal in mind. The detectives had been speaking with her back and forth about what justice would ultimately look like to her as one of the two survivors. What did she want? Crystal decided she wanted to go with the process that would be the least invasive, and together she decided with the authorities that she did not want to pursue the death penalty, so long as they spent the rest of their lives in prison. The determining factor for me was I have a surviving teenage young girl and a toddler, and those children deserve a life. And I am not going to saddle them with what I know the reality of a death penalty case to be. I'm confident that uh, we will never be seeing or discussing Robert Bever again. He will not be breathing free air from this moment on. Now, coming from such a young girl who has already seen and been through so much, she could have just said, screw it, and wanted revenge, but she didn't. And I think that that was a very brave and honorable decision on her part. Robert was offered five life sentences without the possibility of parole in exchange for the death penalty being taken off the table, and he gladly agreed. He pled guilty and didn't have to go to trial. Everyone in the town was extremely glad that there had already been some sort of justice without having to really fight for it in a trial and without having to make Crystal testify against him. But they still had Michael to deal with because he was pleading not guilty. His attorney told the media that he was planning on seeking an insanity defense and that he had the evidence to prove it. His legal team was a good one and they did not stop. They were trying to get his confession thrown out, as well as get him to be tried as a juvenile, claiming that denying him the opportunity to be tried as a juvenile is unconstitutional and is the equivalent of the death penalty, since he would live the rest of his life and ultimately die in prison if convicted. They felt that since he had been so young, he should be rehabilitated, and that that would make him able to be a contributing member to society one day. The United States Supreme Court has indicated that a life without parole sentence for a juvenile is in many ways the functional equivalent of the death penalty. During a pretrial hearing for Michael in 2018, his attorney claimed that there was critical evidence missing in the case. The critical evidence that they were referring to was the computer, as well as the hard drive that might contain video from the night of the murders. The attorneys further claimed that the evidence was not handled correctly and that some of the evidence had even been found in an officer's locker at work. Almost a full year after Robert's guilty plea, Michael's trial began. This trial was extremely difficult for everyone involved, especially the jurors as well as Crystal, who had to see and hear the absolute brutal and gory details of that night. The defense continued to argue that Michael was led astray by Robert and that he had never actually wanted to kill or hurt anyone. They also claimed that their parents had been physically and psychologically abusive toward all of the children. These allegations of abuse were something that Michael and Robert's lawyers both had been started talking about even before Michael's trial began. 
Robert's attorney even told the media at one point that life in prison without parole would be a better life for Robert than what he had been experiencing in his home life, but he never went into detail on it. Despite the prosecution's best efforts to keep Crystal out of it, she ended up testifying via a video monitor on the very first day of trial. Crystal told the courtroom about how that day had been a very normal one for her entire family. Robert and two of her siblings even went bowling together that day, and nobody could have ever imagined that just hours later, Robert would be the leader of this sadistic attack on their own family. Crystal described her home life growing up and said that she felt it had been a very good one. She described the house and how big it was with plenty of rooms for the kids and endless amounts of toys. She testified about how she shared a room with her little sister while Michael and Robert had shared a room together. She also described how Robert and Michael were very secretive, keeping mostly to themselves, saying they would let her in sometimes, but the majority of the time, it was just those two against everyone else. She also testified that during the actual attacks, she never physically saw Michael hurting any of their family members, although she does say that the two were extremely close and exhibited the same odd behaviors that she had once noticed in the months leading up to the murders. She talked about how they began collecting knives and armor, and how it scared her, and how she even said that a few months before the murders, Michael had told her about their plan to kill the entire family, and had asked her to join him and Robert. This scared her even more, especially since she wasn't obsessed with true crime and serial killers in the same way that they were. She had not only told April about that knife collection and that that was scaring her, but she apparently had even told her about the plans that Michael and Robert had. But once again, April brushed her off and didn't believe her. In general, it can be hard for parents to see their children as being troublemakers or even unkind, so maybe it was very difficult for her to believe that Robert and Michael could be capable of harming anyone, any living thing, let alone the entire family. But Crystal was confiding in an adult about things that should never be taken lightly, threats that should never be taken lightly. And while I don't ever want to blame April for what happened here because it's not her fault at all, I found myself wondering why she didn't just take the knives away as a precautionary measure when Crystal was telling her about the threats. Crystal recalled the exact moment that she had been attacked. She was up watching TV with her mom April like she usually does, when her mom asked her to go and get the boys to tell them to help her with the dishes. When she got to their door, she noticed that the armor and the knives were laid out on their bed. Michael then told her that he had something to show her on his computer, and he invited her in. It wasn't an odd request, so of course, she went into the room, which also distracted her. Once she was at the computer with Michael, that's when Robert came up from behind her, closed her mouth, and started attacking her from behind. Now, after hearing this extremely graphic and awful testimony, the prosecution focused on asking Crystal whether or not she was aware of any abuse in the home since the defense had made it seem like it was prevalent in the home and Crystal testified that she did believe that her father, David, was emotionally abusive in ways, but that she never knew him to be physically or mentally abusive. She also shared that her mother, April, had never exhibited any harmful behaviors toward any of the children. Michael was very emotional and even crying during Crystal's testimony. It seemed as if maybe he had a bit of remorse for the things that he had done. The 911 operator working the night of the call was the second person to testify that day, and before she could even begin, she was already in tears. The 911 recording was played in the courtroom, and Michael was also extremely emotional during that call. There were two medical examiners who did the autopsies. Dr. Lanter performed the autopsies on the parents David and April, and Dr. Arbo performed the autopsies on Daniel, Christopher, and Victoria. These deaths had been some of the most gruesome that they had ever seen. Each family member had so many stab wounds that it was difficult to tell the exact amount of times that they had been stabbed, as well as how many knives were used and what types of knives they even were. When it was Dr. Lantern's turn to testify, a diagram of April's body was displayed, showing the placement of the 48 known stab wounds that she had on her body. He also testified that April had a number of defensive marks on her hands, so many that the actual skin on her hands and her fingers was falling off. She fought them off like hell, trying to protect herself and her family. She also had internal bleeding and blunt force trauma to her head. April's death was definitely one of the more gory and brutal ones in the family. Their father, David, had been stabbed a total of 38 times, 
and it had caused lots of damage to his organs. Dr. Lanter said that he would only have been able to live a few minutes based on all of the trauma and damage that had happened. Dr. Arbo, who did the kids' autopsies, was next to take the stand. He said that among the nine stab wounds on Daniel, one of those had punctured his left lung, three of his major arteries, and his trachea. Even with medical intervention, it would have been unlikely for him to survive. Christopher had 21 injuries to his body, and six of them were stab wounds. The other 15 were cuts and things of that nature. Victoria was the youngest and the smallest child who was injured in these brutal attacks. However, with 18 stab wounds, she had been stabbed more than any of her other siblings, which to me just shows what a power trip Michael and Robert were on. The youngest one, who had absolutely zero fighting chance, had more stab wounds than any other child, which is really hard to think about and get your mind around. A former Broken Arrow officer also testified. The officer had gone to that local gun shop where Robert had purchased multiple guns from, but apparently never got the chance to pick up. In his order were two handguns and a shotgun, presumably for the nationwide killing spree that they were preparing to go on after murdering their family. Because Robert was only 18 and not 21, it turns out he actually wouldn't have even been allowed to pick up the guns that were being shipped to the store for him. Multiple first responders on the scene also testified. One of them was the first responding officer who arrived at the house and who found 13-year-old Crystal. He also was the officer who had interactions with Michael after he was cuffed in the back of the car. He described Michael as being stoic, flat, and emotionless. But he did say that Michael had said, I hope they're okay, referring to his family inside the home. He also said that it was by far the bloodiest scene that he had ever seen in his 15-year career. A firefighter that had arrived at the scene testified that he thinks about the night every single day and that it will always stand out to him. This trial was clearly devastating for everyone. A veteran crime scene investigator even took the stand to walk the jurors through each photo that was taken at the crime scene, and even he could not keep his composure and get through the testimony. This is someone whose entire career is built on seeing death and gore, and even he wasn't able to turn off his humanity switch and get through this testimony unscathed. There was a moment in court that was just, oh. The crime scene investigator who's been testifying is a big barrel chested man. He's been a CSI probably 15 years, investigated 1500 scenes. He has matter of factly been walking these jurors through dozens of crime scene photos that depict blood on this wall, blood on this floor, blood on this piece of furniture, even described for them the bloody body of David Beather, the father. But when that picture popped up on the screen of seven year old Christopher, and five-year-old Victoria in what appeared to be their pajamas, huddled in a bathroom floor, blood everywhere. He couldn't go on. He had to step out of the courtroom for a moment and collect himself, and it was during that time I saw two jurors reach for a tissue. When it was the defense's turn, they decided to throw a curveball that nobody was expecting. They had Robert actually take the stand and testify, and he did that for an entire day. He told the courtroom about how leading up to the murders, it wasn't actually a plan that they felt like they would ever actually go through. He said it was more so something to make him feel better. He even broke down at one point saying that he was sorry and that he didn't know what he was even thinking doing this. Robert described in detail the entire chain of events that happened that night, and he took the blame for every single death and attack. He said that he didn't even remember seeing his brother ever holding a knife, despite the fact that Michael had confessed, and he even described the exact type of knife that he used and what it looked like. Not only that, but the knives were shown in the trial, and they were proven to have Michael's DNA on them. Robert admitted that Michael had deceived their younger siblings to open the doors that they were hiding behind, but said that once the doors were open, he was the one to kill them, not Michael. Robert even shared something about the murders that nobody had heard before since he never had a trial. We knew that Robert and Michael both loved to keep a journal and often drew pictures of famous serial killers that they admired and looked up to. But Robert told the courtroom that he created a character in his journals whose name was also Robert Bever. The Robert in his journal was cold and heartless and a famous serial killer. He said that the way that he was able to go through with the killing so easily that night was because his body flipped a switch where he became that character in his mind, 
which then allowed him to be emotionless and to not even think about his actions. Michael's attorneys were hopeful that Robert's testimony would help them in their case. They felt like after talking to Robert themselves in the initial investigation, Robert was extremely truthful and an open book about the murders and the events leading up to the murders. Some of the things that he testified about, though, about Michael aiding him by deceiving the younger siblings was not super helpful, though, and Michael's attorneys realized that. When he talked about what happened in the house, um, honestly, not all of it helped me, but it was the truth to Robert. Robert wrapped up his testimony by clarifying that he didn't come to help out his brother. He came because it was time for everyone to hear the truth that nobody had heard since he never had a trial, and he wanted to share his own side of the story to the masses. Clearly, Robert is mentally ill, but um, that we, what we heard was Robert's truth. I think it's hard for a jury or anyone to understand this story uh, without understanding what was happening inside that home. Now, I can't say I'm shocked that he wanted his own side of the story being told, because it kind of feels like it's in line with him wanting that notoriety. The district attorney, as well as I'm sure many others, felt that while Robert's testimony did give more details, it wasn't super helpful, and it wasn't like everyone was just going to believe everything that he was saying was automatically true. He was already serving multiple life sentences, so he had nothing to lose by making it seem like he was the sole person to blame for these murders, for the murders of his parents and siblings. Not to mention the fact that he wanted to be a famous serial killer. So maybe he didn't want to share those victories and share them with somebody else. Maybe he wanted to take all of the credit for the notoriety. Maybe it was for selfish reasons, not just to save his brother. Yeah, it's very obvious that uh, where he wants it to be for the benefit of <laughs> making him look like uh, he's solely responsible, then he'll play that role. He, he couldn't even keep track of his story. After four weeks of emotional testimony, Michael's trial finally came to an end. Michael was ultimately found guilty and sentenced to five consecutive life sentences as well as 28 years for the assault and battery charge. Now, what was shocking was that after all of the details of everything came out in the trial, members of the jury actually wrote a letter to the judge, hoping that his sentences would be served concurrently in order for him to have a chance at parole. Not sure why, however, the judge did deny it and the sentences were ordered to be served consecutively. Well, Craig, the jury found Michael Bever guilty on all six counts, five counts of first degree murder, as well as one count of assault and battery with a deadly weapon. When we were in court and the jury verdict was read, many of the jurors, most of the jurors were crying. One was sobbing quite hard. The bailiff was handing out tissues. Michael Bever looked down. He looked at the jurors. He kind of almost sank into his chair at one point before being handcuffed. After both boys were handed down their sentences, when everyone thought that Robert and Michael's violent history would be done, Robert proved everybody wrong. At around 4.40 p.m. on July 15, 2019, while in the day room in prison, Robert approached two guards from behind, and he was holding a weapon. Luckily, one of the other staff members was nearby and was able to wrap Robert in a bear hug and order him to drop the weapon before anyone was seriously injured. It seems that maybe he was wanting to attack the two guards at the prison in an attempt to keep those serial killer numbers up or to just keep harming people. He ended up being charged and then in 2020 he was sentenced to three additional life sentences due to that incident. As for the Bever family home, in 2017 a group in Broken Arrow decided to create a foundation which would demolish the Bever family home that had been sitting empty since those murders and they were going to replace it with a memorial garden. However, a fire happened shortly after these plans went public. Luckily, the fire did not ruin the plans set in place for the home. The community managed to gather $50,000 that went toward that memorial. They wanted to focus heavily on the victims who passed that night and the surviving family members as well, as well as all of the first responders on that horrible night. The park has a beautiful white gazebo in the middle of it, and it is surrounded by trees and flowers everywhere. It is a light brought together replacing something that reminded the whole community of the pure evil and darkness that took place that night in 2015. Now, I would love to hear your thoughts down in the comment section. Do you think that Robert was the leader in these awful killings and forced his brother to participate? Or do you think that Michael was more than willing until he saw the consequences of his actions? It seems like they kind of fueled off of each other and had this sinister plan in place, almost to be like a Bonnie and Clyde but brother situation. Or what's that other movie with, um, 
what is it, uh, natural born murders or something like that. Kind of like they wanted to do this murder spree across the country. All for what, notoriety? I hardly believe that it was just one of them who was spearheading it all. It seems like it was really a dual attack and planned from the start. But I'm curious to know what you think. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Dark Chapters with Annie Elise, and thank you for hearing the Bevers family story. If you want to make sure not to miss any future episodes of Dark Chapters in the future, make sure that you hit that subscribe button below and turn your notification bell to on. Thanks again, guys, and until the next case, stay safe.